You're listening to Let's Talk Creation with Todd Wood and Paul Garner, the creation show where we learn, grow, and worship. Well, welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Creation with Paul Garner and Todd Wood. I'm Paul Garner. And I'm Todd Wood. Uh, Don't uh, forget to subscribe, uh, like and share our episodes, and of course, um, donate um, to help keep the podcast going. Um, All of those good things. You can check out our website, letstalkcreation.org, and of course, you can find us on YouTube and lots of other streaming platforms. And yeah, just make sure you spread the word and t- tell your friends about us. That would be absolutely great. Uh, Todd, we are uh, back this time for another episode in our biblical chronology series, which, uh, where we've been looking at um, the numbers in the biblical genealogies and how they differ between the different textual traditions. Uh, last episode, uh, we compared the numbers in the Hebrew Masoretic text with the Greek Septuagint text. Yeah. That was um, a, the Septuagint. That was a slog. So, we really. <laughs> <laughs> it was very complicated. Yeah, let's, it was. Let's say that. So, uh, yeah. So we we kind of uh, looked at all the the differences in the numbers between those two text traditions and tried to sort of get to the bottom of what the differences really amounted to. Um, and yeah, it was it was tough going, <laughs> but I, I think we needed to to, to do that. Yeah. Um, at the end of that episode, Todd, um, you mentioned another set of numbers from something called the Samaritan Pentateuch. Yeah. And so we thought, you know, we really need to um, make that the topic uh, of our next episode. Um, so we've, we've done several episodes now in this biblical chronology series. Why are we only getting to the Samaritan Pentateuch now, Todd? Oh, goodness. Well, uh, on the one hand, I just thought, the Samaritan Pentateuch is going to add a layer of complexity to something that's already pretty terribly confusing. <laughs> so I thought we need to we need to simplify this as much as we can and lead people along a little bit at a time because I'm we're still trying to make this accessible to people. And the second reason was uh, you might remember the Samaritans, Paul, from the New Testament, um, how the Jews and the Samaritans hated each other, uh, and so I felt like. You know, the Samaritans keeping their own copy of, of the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, they're, they have a pretty strong motivation to make it, to change it, to make it more friendly to whatever they want to believe about uh, the, the law. So, um, and maybe that's un, unfair of me to say that, but we know that there are changes in the Samaritan Pentateuch that are pretty clearly done to make it more favorable to the to the Samaritan way of thinking. So I felt like it's kind of a biased source. So maybe we should talk about it uh, after we do the, the Greek and the Hebrew versions, the, the Masoretic and Samar- uh, <clears throat> Septuagint. Boy, this is going to be confusing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, that, that kind of makes sense. So yeah. uh, for good or ill, we've, we've decided to sort of take the plunge now and have a look at the Samaritan Pentateuch and make things even more confusing than they were for our listeners already. Um, But to help us try to sort of navigate all of this complexity, um, we've got a special guest with us today, um, Nate Labadorf. Um, Nate has uh, an MA in Biblical Studies and an MDiv from Bob Jones University. And Todd, um, you know Nate, I think, because uh, he's also a research associate with Gore Academy of Science. And before we sort of bring Nate on and sort of welcome him to the show, um, you just wanted to say something about that uh, research associate yeah. program. Yeah. So, so last year I proposed this to our, our board. I suggested that we set aside some money for part-time mm. research associates to work with Core Academy. And the vision that I had was that I know so many people who are, uh, you know, highly capable and academically well-trained and yet find themselves in career choices that aren't not really academic at all. (laughs) And that's great because, you know, you got to make a living and you got to take care of your family and you got to take care of your kids and all that good stuff. So I don't, I don't grudge those decisions at all, but I thought that we could use, uh, you know, Core Academy's uh, research program to maybe uh, give those sorts of folk uh, an outlet for their uh, scholarly creativity. And so I'm really happy to have Nate with us. We have another one, Katie McGuire. She's uh, 
more in the geosciences and computational uh, geoscience area. Um, and she is a mom. Uh, she's uh, chosen to just um, be a mom. And, and yet she has all this great training, and we're really happy to have her. Uh, and so, yeah, and I'm really happy to have Nate, too. And he's going to be working with us on questions of human origins, which, surprise, surprise, imagine that. Uh, yeah, we're interested <laughs> in human origins, and so is he. So, Yeah, oh, that's great. Well, um, let's welcome Nate to the show. Nate, it's really great to have you uh, with us. Uh, so glad you could join us today. Man, it's really great to be with you, Paul and Todd. Uh, really excited to work with the research, uh, research associate position here. and. Um, talk about Bible, which is really what I love to talk about all the time. So, Yeah, that's great. Now, I, I gave a very brief sort of bio there. Is there anything I, yeah. I missed out, or does that kind of cover, cover it, really? Uh, that's basically my education. Uh, I love the Old Testament uh, in particular. Uh, Genesis has always been kind of a, you know, I, I always end up back in Genesis studying it for some reason or another. So, uh, you know, this is right down my alley. Um, Ancient languages, uh, you know, and uh, comparative cultures, also things that I love doing, uh, looking into and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's great. That's great. Oh, well, we're, we're really glad that you're here today. Um, and to help us sort of navigate through the complexities of uh, yet another textual tradition <laughs> of the Old Testament. Um, uh, so we're, we're going to be thinking about the Samaritan Pentateuch. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought probably a good good place to begin was with the Samaritans themselves, which, you know, as Todd has said, you know, some of us will be familiar with because we read about them in, in the New Testament and so on. Um, so who were the Samaritans? Could you, could you tell us a bit about them and, you know, where we think they came from? Yeah, so the Samaritans, of course, yeah, we find them in the New Testament, and we see this group that's kind of growing uh, from the, if you remember your biblical history, uh, from the from the northern kingdom of Israel, and so we're actually going to go start back back in the time of uh, you know David and Solomon, and we'll we'll kind of walk through how this group kind of emerged uh, and became kind of uh, you know akin to the uh, the to the Jewish tradition. Um, so of course, uh, so we're talking the early Iron Age. So this would have been about a thousand BC, uh, somewhere in there. Of course, we got Saul, David, Solomon. That's the United Kingdom, the United, well, not the UK where you live, but uh, the uh, <laughs> the United Monarchy in Israel. Um, and uh, of course, they those three kings, you know, for better or for worse, worked together or uh, worked in succession and built the kingdom of Israel into its its glory. But then, you know, Solomon sinned, right? And um, and because of that, he split the kingdom, or God split the kingdom into the northern, the ten northern tribes and the two southern tribes. And um, of course, the whole story about Rehoboam and everybody comes to him and it's like, hey, Solomon was cool and all, but he was kind of taxing us a little too much. Can you um, give us a break? And uh, Rehoboam, Solomon's son, um, Go talk to the old people, and they give him sage advice, and he ignores it and talks to his buddies. And of course, uh, he goes out and says, "You know, we're going to tax you even more and work even harder than you thought before." Um, and people don't like that, so uh, not great politics on his end. And so Jeroboam, who was uh, it says a servant of Solomon, but he was a high official. Um, in the court there with Solomon, serving Solomon in that sense. Uh, Jeroboam led a rebellion, uh, essentially, and broke off those northern tribes is kind of how it panned out. Now, here's where we start getting into the religious differences. Of course, God said, you know, God still had his center of worship in Jerusalem. But uh, Jeroboam, who seems to been a better politician than uh, Rehoboam, said, well, hey, if everybody's going back to Judah to worship in Jerusalem, uh, they're going to go back, you know, and start worshiping, uh, and they, they'll they start, they'll keep worshiping Judah and Jerusalem, uh, God in Jerusalem, and uh, they may, you know, switch their loyalties back to the line of David. Uh, even though God had promised him, hey, you know, you'll have, an, you'll have a line if, if you just follow me. And uh, so he set up his own kind of 
religious system. Now they were still worshiping Yahweh. Um, but he set up these golden bowls in Dan and Bethel, uh, so the top and the to the north and the south of his kingdom, and basically said, Hey, uh, worship God at these sites. This is the same God, it's just you know, now it's in our country versus having to go across the border to Judah. Um, and so that's kind of where we start seeing the religious split between the northern and the southern kingdoms. Now, that kind of development, of course, that was the great sin of Jeroboam uh, that is repeated all the way through the books of uh, Kings. And um, and we see how the country departed from God uh, over the years through that. Now, the name Samaritan itself. Um, so before the group, uh, the Samaritans, as we know them as a distinct religious group, uh, came about, the name Samaritan was coined uh during the Omri Ahab dynasty. Um and it's because during this era the northern kingdom set up its capital in Samaria, uh the city, the town of Samaria, and that's in First Kings 1624. And so of course people from Samaria became known as Samaritans. And then um Eventually, that name kind of moved to stick to this religious group uh, that we find later in the record. So, you know, it's we, we find these hints all the way back then. Um, but there's not really like what we know of the Samaritans today. Wasn't really a group that far back, but we see the beginnings of it all the way back in then. And then, of course, we have. Um, the developments, uh, well, uh, the the uh, nation of Assyria comes in, and that's about 722 BC. So, in that time period, 722 BC, under the reign of Sargon II, the Assyrians conquered Samaria and deported mainly the elites. And to as assert their control over the territory, their newly conquered territory. The Assyrians imported foreigners into the land, so they exported, you know, the people who were running things, brought in all these new um, rulers, but they didn't worship Yahweh. Of course, they're bringing their gods with them, and so Yahweh sent wild animals, plagued them, um, and, and such, as we read in the text. And so they kind of get it figured out, hey, we're, we're, we're worshiping the wrong god. Um and so they got an Israelite priest who came on the scene and he started teaching them how to worship God. Um, and that's in 2 Kings 17, 28. Now, they worshipped Yahweh, but they kind of worshipped him alongside of other gods. Um, and so there's kind of syncretism going on. And uh, there's a lot of uh, cultural exchange and there's, uh, you know, transitions uh, that were going on in this period. Now. At the same time, um, contemporaneously, in the southern kingdom, of course, you have Hezekiah, who uh, barely made it through the Assyrian uh, invasion. And so he's trying to initiate reforms and revitalizing, uh, you know, worship of Yahweh there in, in Jerusalem and Judah. And his influence did extend into the northern kingdom, but... They had limited effects up there because of, you know, all this changing uh, circumstances are going on. And so. Um, uh, and so he's trying to do his thing uh, by the by the strength of God, but, uh, you know, it doesn't make a wholesale revival, if you would, in the northern kingdom. And then there wasn't just one. Uh, importation, I don't know if that's the right word or not, uh, you know, the. Uh, the Assyrians didn't just bring one group of people in. Um, they brought in, uh, they have the 722 under Sargon, and then in 680 under Esarhaddon, uh, they imported yet more colonists into the land. Uh, we, and those actually, uh, we find in uh, Ezra 4 verse 2, those um, colonists actually started worshiping Yahweh. I don't know if they worship solely Yahweh, but uh, they seem to have begun worshiping Yahweh at that time and all the way down to the time of Ezra. Uh, and then there was a third wave that came in uh, in 660 BC. So there was just a lot of change and a lot of um, 
uh, syncretism going on during this time, as far as we can tell. Um, and then after that, uh, you had King Josiah, of course, and he did a lot to try to, uh, you know, re, uh, revitalize worship of Yahweh in the southern kingdom. But he also invited a lot of people from the northern kingdom to come down and to worship with them. Uh, that's in Second Chronicles uh, 34, verse 9. And, and so you see this, again, you see this interplay where you have this kind of a push back towards, hey, come, let's worship Yahweh. And so it's kind of hard to see, but it seems like even to the time right before the uh, captivity uh, of the southern kingdom, there was, uh, yes, there's a lot of syncretism coming in, but there also seems to be this core of people that were still worshiping Yahweh. And even though they might not have worshipped him at the same place, they were worshiping uh, the same the same God. Um, does that make sense so far? Yeah, yeah, so. that's very helpful. That's yeah, that's that's great as a kind of potted history. That that's very helpful in kind of bring, bringing us up up to. So we've got up basically to the the captivity yeah. in Babylon, yeah, um, yeah. where um, Nebuchadnezzar sort of captures Jerusalem, doesn't he? In, in five nine seven, um, uh, kind of take up the is is that right? Take take up the story for, from there. Yeah, correct me yeah. if I'm wrong about anything too. Oh no, you're good. Uh, yeah, well, there's, yeah, there's multiple de deportations too of mm. the um, uh, uh, Judites. Of course, Nebuchadnezzar comes through Babylon, uh, start you know do their thing to uh, the southern kingdom there, and this is really where we start seeing um, the development of the uh, Jews versus the Samaritans. So, uh, of course, in 538. Um, we see the Jews coming back, and they return, and this, of course, uh, they start trying to renew the worship of Yahweh in Jerusalem. Um, but they were also opposed by the Samaritans, uh, like Sam Ballot and his, uh, his associates there up in the province of Samaria. Uh, so this time it was just kind of a subsidiary province. Um, so in about of uh, 457 BC, we see Ezra, and he's encountering the resistance uh, from the Samaritans uh, as he tries to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. Now, at first, they were kind of friendly, and they're like, "Hey, you know, let's let's uh, let's help you out a little bit." Uh, but Ezra refused uh, the help, uh, rejecting it because he wanted a pure uh, worship, and that's um, you can find that over there, yeah, in the Book of Ezra. That whole scenario. So at this point, you know, hey, we offered to help you, that, and then you rejected it. So that kind of ticked them off uh, a, a little <laughs> bit there. And um, and so this really begins uh, uh, the, the deep-seated tensions that uh, develop between the, the Jews and the Samaritans. And then, of course, you have uh, a couple years later in 440, um, 444 B.C., Nehemiah comes and he says, I'm going to rebuild the wall, right? And he, um, you know, he scans the walls, he looks up everything. But, you know, up to this point, there, you know, the Samaritans were in Sam Ballot and company were pretty comfortable up there in, um, in Samaria. But then all of a sudden there's this new political entity. Yeah, they had a temple already, but, you know, they didn't have a wall. They weren't really, you know, a strong political entity. Well, when Nehemiah starts building the wall, uh, that's when they start really getting uh, agitated over this because uh, now there's a, uh, you know, now there's these, this group of people carving away their territory or their influence or something. So they start coming in and, of course, they uh, pressure him and try to, you know, um, I believe at one point they try to assassinate him or uh, people in the government. And um, they really push back against them. But, of course, God gives them grace and helps them get the wall rebuilt and establish the uh, um, southern kingdom, or at least the province of Judah again. So that's the return, and we see these tensions starting to build. Now, they're not always super tense between the two groups. At some points, they're a little bit more friendly than others. Um, but there is always this, but there is an underlying tension underneath even the friendliest of times when they interact. Uh, so that's where basically the scripture ends. 
Um, and then we get into more of the secular histories uh, that we find. And we found out, and actually, uh, of course, you have the Babylonian, and then they get defeated by the Persians. And then, and then after that, the Greeks come in and take over the known world. And uh, it's during that time, Alexander the Great, uh, he comes through, and about 332, so we're talking about 100 or so, a little over 100 years after Ezra and Nehemiah, um, the Samaritans were uh, allowed to build their temple on Mount Gerizim. They mentioned Alexander the Great, and he said, go for it. So they mm-hmm. built the temple. They dedicated it. Excuse me. They dedicated it to Yahweh. And this represented their central place of worship uh, for the Samaritan community. Um, they set up their own high priesthood and all that kind of stuff. And, and at this point, it seems like a lot of the syncretism from the other religions that had been in, coming into um, the northern kingdom, Samaria, uh, they, it seems to have waned, the, at least the influence of it. Um, and giving it gave way to more of a Torah focused uh, Judaism, uh, religion, it's the religion like Judaism. So they were very, uh, and the great, you know, uh, and all the different beliefs that were surrounding them back time, they were very, very close to, uh, what, why do they, why do they worship at Mount Gerizim? How do they come to choose that mountain in particular? Um, the, the Mount Gerizim, uh, so that was, um, connected with the, uh, capital city of Samaria. And um, I think it probably the roots with that uh, go back to um, uh, go back to this Jeroboam uh, Rehoboam divide is my guess. Um, the Samaritans, of course, believe that it has always been that way, um, and we'll get to it later. But they even added a tenth commandment. They rearranged the ten commandments and slipped one in there for you, where God commanded them build on Mount Gerizim. So, uh, you know, it, I, I'm not exactly sure um, 100% uh, this is the reason why, but I'm pretty sure it has has to do with going back with the um, capital city of Samaria being there and then the, uh, um, that divide between the two states. Yeah. But now here, here's a kicker. So... During that time, of course, Alexander the Great dies, right? And then you have mm. the division of his empire, and you have the uh, Seleucids, and there's, you know, Antiochus Epiphanes coming in. And he's, we, you know, you heard about the Maccabean, Maccabean revolt. There we go. Um, and all that. And, of course, uh, they're fighting for their lives down in uh, the province of Judah. Well, the Samaritans, instead of sticking up to their kind of close kin, uh, they uh, decide. They told um, Antiochus, uh, "Yeah, we're not Jews. Uh, we're 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 non-Jewish." And they even took their temple and dedicated it to uh, to Zeus. And so, uh, you know, they're turncoats. They're trying to save their own skin, so they just, you know, uh, capitulate to Antiochus. And so, of course, that stokes even more hatred at that time um, because, you know, hey, we're fighting for our lives. You guys just ran the other way. And then and so, of course, the Maccabean revolt was successful. And so in 128, um, uh, the new ruler, uh, John Hyrcanus, uh, that's in Judah, he comes up and he actually demolishes the temple of Mount Gerizim. And that just kind of nailed it. Like at that point, it was just intense hatred between the two groups. Um, and so they still practice their worship at Mount Gerizim, but uh, they no longer had the temple uh, because the Jews destroyed it. And of course, that brings us down pretty much to the New Testament period. Um, and there's just widespread hatred between the two groups. And uh Remember the woman at the well in Samaria, um, and everybody is shocked except for Jesus that Jesus is talking to this <laughs> Samaritan woman, right? As the, the disciples were shocked, the Samaritan woman herself even, um, she's like, "How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink from me, a woman of Samaria?" So you know, it's uh, that's of course in John chapter four, and so everybody's just you know. Oh my goodness! You know why we we hate each other? Why aren't you hating? You know 
It's like, yeah. well, this the message of the gospel is much more powerful than hate. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, I think, all, I, I yeah. think as modern readers, as modern readers, without knowing all of this context, it's very easy to miss how completely shocking that is. Yeah. Right. Jesus is not only talking to a Samaritan, a Samaritan woman at that. I mean, yeah, right. this is this is just kind of contravening all the social norms, isn't it, of the day? Yeah, yeah, and and, and again, it's just uh, we see a sh- like the more you understand the history, the more you understand what Jesus is doing and how the gospel really works and his love um, really transcends those uh, those boundaries, uh, the ethnic and uh, gender boundaries there to to reach people uh, who are needing and who are hurting. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, and you know what else is interesting about that conversation that they have um, is she brings up, of course, you know, uh, uh, she, she says, our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is where the people ought to worship. And, of course, so she brings up this debate that has been going on for a couple hundred years at this point. And, uh, I, and, and so all this, you know, it's a very intricate and interesting history for, for years and years and years that just kind of gets – you know, summarized in this one little narrative, uh, which is pretty, pretty interesting. That's, that's but, amazing. Yeah. So I think, I think, yeah. I, you know, that maybe I think maybe some of our listeners have learned some things. I know I've learned some things here. The idea that they built their own rival temple after Ezra supervised the rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem, and then the Jews went and destroyed mm-hmm. it. No wonder yeah. they hate each other. And then to yeah. see oh, that, yeah. as you say, encapsulated in De- Jesus' encounter with a woman at the well, it's not just about a woman who had five men and the man she has mm-hmm. is not her husband and that sort of thing. It is about this these generations of... of it puts Hatfields and McCoys to shame. Yeah. The, the hatred between these two groups. Um, and Jesus just completely dismisses the big debate. It's not about Jerusalem, and it's not yeah. about Gerizim. You need to worship God in spirit and in truth. It's, it's just beautiful. And that's yeah. just what Jesus does the whole time he's here. You, you yeah. guys kind yeah. of miss the point of the law. It's not about the little details. It's about, yeah, it's about salvation and, and righteousness and yeah. goodness. Loving yeah. God and loving people. Yeah, wow. that's amazing. And, and I, he just cuts right through that. And for her, you know, he's, he's reaching into her life, and he's just— Somehow, you know, uh, he, he's able to just reach right through the 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 the, the politics and and the hatred and yeah. just go, you know, get get to her heart and to uh, heal her. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, yeah. I, I, it's fascinating for sure. Yeah. Now we still have Samaritans around today. This is another yes. thing that you know we've we've learned. So t- tell us about that. Yeah, so th- there, there's still a group of Samaritans. They, uh, they've been larger in his. Uh, the, the group has been larger, and it, it's grown and shrunk throughout history. And um, despite all this hatred, and uh, they were uh, excommunicated from officially from uh, mainstream Judaism actually after the time of Christ. Um, but there's still a small, little marginalized group, and uh, there are about a thousand individuals. They live in the West Bank. Uh, they still go to Mount Gerizim and offer sacrifices. Um, uh, you know, they still practice. So, you know, you think of a good sized church or maybe 10, you know, medium or 10 normal sized churches. That's that's how many people uh, still exist that follow that follow this ethnically. Now, those are the kind of the ethnic and the I guess you say true descendants of the Samaritan uh, line. Um, there are people who identify as. Samaritans who believe, you know, in the Samaritan tenets, um, uh, and there's, they say about twenty thousand of these in Brazil. Um, uh, they follow. It's part of this group called the Shamre Hatora, uh, and so that's as of February of 2023. So, I'm assuming there's still a lot of people. Now I don't know how much they're accepted by you know the the thousand over there in the West Bank, but um, it's still kind of interesting yeah. that there are people reviving the worship, uh, you know, and the beliefs of Samaritanism. 
That's fascinating. And and if you'd asked me to guess where they were in the world, I think Brazil would have been pretty low down on the list. <laughs> yeah. So Yeah, definitely. <laughs> so, that, that, I, yeah, so, I don't get that at all, but hey, I, so, sure. So that that's very surprising. Um Yeah. Okay, so so that's the Samaritans. Um and that that's that, yeah, very interesting. Perhaps yeah. we can come now to the Samaritan Pentateuch itself. So um what is the Samaritan Pentateuch and, and what do we know about where it came from? Um, so yeah, yeah, this is what I find the most fascinating. Um, and so basically Western scholarship didn't really know about it till about 1616. Um, uh, this guy named Pietro de la uh, Valle, uh, just, uh, kind of rediscovered it and transcribed it and brought it into, um, the attention of scholarship. Uh, Jean Morin, he, event- he eventually published, um, his evaluation of the Samaritan Pentateuch, and that's about 1620 or so through the 1630s. Now, uh, the Samaritan Pentateuch, of course, is, is a copy of the first five books of the Bible, and so uh, and it's another textual family. So you have the Masoretic text, you have the Septuagint, and then you have the Samaritan Pentateuch. And um, Morin was coming out, and he was challenging, at that point, the prevailing assumptions about the Masoretic text being the most accurate. Uh, and so he just argued, and there's a whole debate, apparently, and lots of, you know, fights back and forth, like, you know, we like to do in scholarship. And um, he argued that, no, the Samaritan Pentateuch is, uh, is better, is a better uh, um, textual family. And anyway, so there's a big debate for a while. Uh, it all kind of settled down. Uh, 1815, uh, so about 200 years later. Um, if you've ever taken Hebrew, you've you've probably run into this fellow named uh, Wilhelm Gesenius, and um, and he wrote kind of the definitive work on the Samaritan uh, Pentateuch and its literary heritage, and it's a legitimate source of biblical criticism of textual criticism. Um, but it is a secondary source, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Um, so what's also kind of cool about the Samaritan Pentateuch is they actually they don't use the Aramaic square script. That So if you go pick up a Hebrew Bible, or if you just go see any kind of Hebrew, you'll see an Aramaic square script. They actually use a, a different script um, called Paleo-Hebrew. Now, this version of Paleo-Hebrew... Um, it's particular to them, so it's like it's really the Samaritan script, which is a version of the Hasmonean era Paleo Hebrew. So the Ma- Maccabean revolt ended up, you know, setting up the Hasmonean dynasty. So right there before the time of Christ, there was a revival of Paleo Hebrew. Uh, you know, it's a political, it was patriotic to to write in our native script. So uh, and the Samaritan script, which eventually came from that, is actually preserved in. Um, in our in the modern copies of the Samaritan Pentateuch, so that's that's kind of uh, you know fun and interesting that the script has survived all the way down uh, to today. Um, let's see, uh, there's a couple scrolls of it uh, that were found at Qumran um, that follow that, that followed the Samaritan Pentateuch, and including a copy uh, written in Paleo Hebrew, four Q twenty two. If you want to go look it up and try to decipher it yourself it's very fragmentary but um we can decipher enough of it that uh it is it follows the samaritan Pentateuch readings now there, there's one really important thing um so i talked about this thing called secondary it's a uh it's a secondary source for textual criticism and so there's two major kind of layers to the samaritan Pentateuch. you uh and it's kind of like layers of an onion so somewhere about the 12th century, the Samaritan Pentateuch really became like the Samaritan Pentateuch because at that point, there's a sectarian layer that was added uh, to the text. And that, so that's 12th century um, after Christ. And so before that point, uh, and, and so this is when we find the, uh, the Samaritan 10th ten, ten commandment um, about building on Mount Gerizim. I'll actually read that here in a second. But you know, so all those and there's several other places where they insert into the text Mount Gerizim, like it's, it's you know, and uh, they just stick it periodically through <laughs> through the text. Um, 
And I just found it fascinating, especially, uh, you know, they kind of combine the first two Ten Commandments, uh, the first two of the Ten Commandments, and then they slip in one, um, uh, one there at the ends. And if you want, I can read that for you. Let me pull it up here. Yeah, sure. It's it's kind of it's kind of fun. It's it's hilarious how like absolutely precise uh, this this Ten Commandment this Tenth Commandment gets. It says. And it shall come to pass when the Lord thy God will bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, whither thou goest to take possession of it. Thou shalt uh, erect unto thee three large stones, and thou shalt cover them with lime, and thou shalt write upon the stones all the words of the law. And it shall come to pass when ye cross the Jordan, ye shall erect these stones which I command thee upon Mount Gerizim. And thou shalt build there an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones, and thou shalt not lift upon them iron of um, of perfect stones shalt thou build uh, thine altar, and thou shalt bring upon it burnt offerings to the Lord thy God, and thou shalt sacrifice peace offerings, and thou shalt eat there and rejoice before the Lord thy God. Uh, the, that mountain, and here's where it gets really specific, that mountain is on the other side of the Jordan, at the end of the road, towards the going down of the sun, in the land of the Canaanites who dwell in the Arabah, facing Gilgal, close by Elon more facing Shechem. So it's like pinpointed right here. See, the Bible says right here. Of course, they stuck, snuck that one in there about, you know, 12th century, but. Wow. Uh, yeah. So, <laughs> That's very specific. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, wow. So that, that lay, oh, sorry. Were, were you going to say something? No, no, I was, I, I was know. just, I was just shocked at that. That is, as you say, yeah. super specific. And I sort of mentioned at the beginning that there is this, there's kind of this air of bias in the Samaritan Pentateuch. Yeah. That's huge. <laughs> yeah. 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 Very, very, very clear where the temple is supposed to be built and where you're supposed to worship God. Um, now, that that particular layer is quite easy, as you can kind of imagine, to, to peel off, if you would. So every time you see this, you know, very specific Mount Gerizim, type of language um that's probably the longest section that's been changed um as far as the mount gerizim stuff um but when you see that kind of language it's okay you know we look at the masoretic we look at the septuagint yeah this isn't in here so we can we can uh agree that that's not a good uh part of the transcription so you pull that layer off and what's left underneath is actually a decent um textual family similar to that of the Septuagint. And um now there are changes in this layer that you can detect too. Uh and really um it's kind of I, I put it this way, it's a it's a layer of textual transcription. And this this is the text that goes all the way back. This is what they found at Qumran. Um and as far back as we can imagine. Uh as far as uh not as we can imagine, but as you know, far back about the fourth century before Christ. Um, and at some point when the Samaritan Pentateuch started getting its uh, own textual family, there was a scribe who sat down and said, you know what, some of these readings in the text are really hard. Uh, and there's some garbled texts, like in the Masoretic text, Masoretes did very good about preserving the text. Uh, but if there was an error, uh, they didn't correct it. They preserved it. Like uh, sometimes there's some sections where we see like um, verb and subject disagreements and stuff like that. And we know that there's an issue somewhere with the text. Somebody made a mistake at some point in history. You just don't know where. Well, the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch scribes said, hey, look, I'm going to I'm going to correct this. Uh, and so they they fixed a lot of issues uh, to make it more readable. So it wasn't a hack hack job it was by a professional scribe as far as we can tell um and it wasn't just like free and whatever with the text this wasn't the uh um oh come on the message version of you know the of the, of the torah if you would uh it, but they did things like modernizing the grammar interpreting interpreting text to make it more clear editing confusing passages and copying texts and parallel passages, adjusting language. It's, um, and, and you can kind of tell those when you go through uh, and do your textual criticism after years of uh, grad work. Uh, you, you can look at those, and they're not too bad to figure out. And we'll actually look at one of these in Genesis chapter 11, where 
um, they copied from the parallel passages into Genesis 11. So we'll we'll get to that right. here in a little bit. So that's kind right. of the so down of it. But yeah. Yeah, so it so so basically this this Pentateuch, as the name suggests, is is the first five books of the Bible. Mm -hmm. yeah. How did they view the other books of the Old Testament? Did they see any value in those at all? They didn't clearly see them as inspired I'm, scripture. Right. I'm uh not totally sure on that one. Uh I was focused on this particular the Samaritan Pentateuch part. I sure. imagine it would have taken a secondary role. They probably wouldn't have thrown it out, but it it obviously wasn't part of their their sacred scripture for sure. Yeah, yeah. So okay, yeah. No, that that's very helpful. Todd, have you got any questions about the the text itself before we kind of move on and think so, about some of the chronological questions? Yeah. So we know there are Qumran texts that follow the wording, mm -hmm. yes. and we know mm -hmm. there was this Hasmonean revival of using paleo hebrew as a yes. patriotic thing um yeah. so i assume the original i don't know how to describe this the original source of the samaritan must be older than that it must be pretty old it's not just a medieval yeah. hack job on oh. the actual pentateuch but the wording there are wording changes that go back quite a long ago right right so what we can tell um and a lot of this um if you're in textual criticism you've heard the name emmanuel tov uh, a lot of this comes from him uh but the best we can tell is of course the the masoretic text uh kind of came from ezra or at least kind of his group the rabbinic group um but remember he went to babylon and came back Mm -hmm. Um, and so you, and so we can describe the Masoretic text or the Proto Masoretic as a uh, kind of a Babylonian edition of the text. Meanwhile, while while well, there's some people in Babylon, others like Jeremiah and such uh, stay in the land, mm -hmm. and so you have kind of a Palestinian um, text type that's growing up, and so. Um, Somewhere, somewhere in the fourth century, what you have a Pal Palestinian text type and the Babylonian text type. Of course, they meet together in Jerusalem as as thing as the people are brought back into the land, and so you have this pa Palestinian text type that then splits into uh, the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch. So the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch uh, share a lot of similar features. So some of these editings uh, to clarify the text. Um, of course, I'm talking about the Septuagint, we call it the Vorlaga. So the Hebrew text that underlies the Septuagint mm -hmm. uh, that shares a lot of similar readings between the Samaritan Pentateuch uh, and itself. And so eventually those two break and um, become the Samaritan Pentateuch tradition, the Proto SP, and then you have the Hebrew, the Vorlaga for the Septuagint, and eventually that gets translated, and we get that. So it's a very uh, complicated time yeah. uh, in yeah. uh, textual <laughs> transmission history. So it's it, it gets really weird, and there's lots of cool stuff about it. But yeah. that's you know, and just uh, just to clarify crazy. to our audience, when you use that that word Vorlaga. That is a word that means you have a text and the Vorlaga is the original text from which that came from. So the Septuagint is a translation. The Vorlaga is the Hebrew original that it was translated from. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah. Didn't yeah, want to lose absolutely. anyone. That that was a really weird new word. So I wanted to make sure everybody got that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, we like new, weird, cool words and... Um... Yeah, in, in theology, it makes us feel better about ourselves. So, um. <laughs> oh, we do it in science too. Yep. Mm -hmm. All scholars <laughs> like to be very precise in their wording. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. So, that, yeah so go for it. Well, I was going to say that that's great. That's um, that's a very helpful introduction to the text. Um, now, of course, the reason we we're interested in this is because we've been doing this series on chronology 
And um, we're interested to know what does the Samaritan Pentateuch say in Genesis 5 and Genesis 11, particularly, because that's where we find the genealogies. And then how the, the SP compares to the two texts that we've already looked at, the Masoretic and the Septuagint. So, yeah, maybe you could help us to navigate this because i have a feeling this is going to get really complicated yeah, again <laughs> yeah yeah so uh yeah we end up multiple you know well we have a lot of differences between the masoretic and the septuagint and then you have a lot of differences between the mt and the sp and then between the septuagint and the sp and we just start multiplying issues all over the place because in a lot of places they don't agree and then in other places they do it just gets weird um uh, so let's let's tackle Genesis five here, um, and let's. Uh, so the difference is, of course, between the MT and well, the um, uh, Septuagint. Uh, they, of course, the total lifespans of the individuals um, and the Septuagint generally align with each other before the flood, uh, with the exception of Lamech, Noah's father. Um, and the beginning ages of uh, of the first five in Enoch, um, uh, sorry, not the beginning, the beginning ages of the uh, the first six generations uh, uh, of the first five in Enoch uh, all agree, but um, but differ uh, by century between these. Uh, sorry, the beginning ages differ by century between these two traditions. So somebody went in and lowered that number by a century. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't know who's right and who's wrong, but somebody did. Um, so yeah, it gets kind of confusing there. Uh, and then what you end up with is the, screp the discrepancy extends the pre-flood chronology by about 600 years and the Septuagint compared to the Masoretic text. So you got an extra 600 years there. Now, between the Septuagint and the Samaritan Pentateuch, um, the Samaritan Pentateuch consistently records shorter beginning ages uh, than the Septuagint by at least 100 years. So it, it, it consistently uh, uh, cuts that number down. And the most uh, striking difference, of course, is Lamech, uh, where the Septuagint uh, lists its beginning age at 188 years, whereas the Samaritan Pentateuch uh, goes a little bit more uh, and not just. 88 years, 100 years less, but actually a substantial gap of 135 years. So you end up with uh, uh, 35, or sorry, 53 years um, as the, uh, for the beginning day, beginning age of Lamech. Um, so what that ends up with is you got in the Samaritan Pentateuch uh, about 1,200 years uh, from Adam to to Noah to the flood there. Whereas the Septuagint has about uh, 2,100 years. And so you end up with almost 1,000 years of difference. So even greater, uh, you end up with 935 years difference between the two. And so um, an even a sh uh, shorter time period between Adam and uh, the flood. So it really cuts that down by a lot. Um, and yeah, and so, and then the differences, of course, then between the Masoretic text and the Samaritan Pentateuch, um, it disagree. The Samaritan Pentateuch disagrees with the Masoretic text on Jared, Methuselah, and Lamech. Um, it consistently records these shorter uh, beginning ages uh, by at least a century from the Masoretic text. Um, and so again, we end up with a really short time period uh, versus, and um, so Septuagint's the longest, uh, Masoretic text is in the middle, and Samaritan Pentateuch is the shortest, and that's before the flood. So, yeah, sorry, it, yeah. it gets trying to keep my numbers straight and then all the text straight, it gets a little <laughs> uh, tricky. But it is kind of convenient, uh, though, no, that, the, that the Septuagint and the Samaritan as you say, differ by exactly, well, roughly a century mm -hmm. for most generations, yeah, yeah. Uh, for every generation. I mean, it's not skipping some, like the Septuagint versus the Masoretic, where you have to figure out, well, why right. did they skip these generations? 
that's not taking nope. place in in the in the um, Samaritan. They are s- consistent, consistently different. Yeah. And, yeah, and this is one of the places where you can point to and say, "Hey, you know, this looks like a scribal." A scribe went in and said, uh, and was copying this, and was like, "Hey, there's a difference here," but um, you know, I want to keep it consistent. So when he changed numbers, you know, he changed those numbers, and it was going to look good the whole way through. Yeah. Yeah. Um, at least according to his mind. Um, so yeah, it's, and so we would say, okay, probably these numbers here can, since it is so consistent, uh, we'd say it's probably not the right reading uh, of the original. Um, you know, it's, we need more data to be yeah. able to really make that determination. Yeah, yeah. You know, like if, if somebody yeah. would go out there and find the original copy of Genesis uh, that Moses wrote, it'd be great. It would solve a lot of questions. Right, but. yeah. It would be nice <laughs> to get even that. even some textual evidence. We have some yeah. first century AD, first century BC texts of Genesis, but we don't have anything that old that records any of these begetting ages. So Right. And, and the frustrating things about scrolls is, of course, you know, the outside tends to wear away first. Yes. And mm. so we often are missing the first couple chapters right. of Genesis on these things. And so it just, yeah, it just, you know, if only they wrote in mud and clay instead of papyrus. Right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so what about Genesis 11 uh, then? Genesis 5 yeah. is yes. consistent. Yeah. So when we compare the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint, um, and the Masoretic text of Genesis 5, of course, we find a lot of these differences here. Um, let's see, the Septuagint Masoretic text typically is only the beginning ages, begetting ages. I don't know why I keep saying beginning, but the begetting ages of the life, and then um, the lifespan of the individuals and gene- genealogical records. It does not add them up for us and give us the total years. Mm -hmm. However, the Samaritan Pentateuch actually does that for us, and it's super convenient. Uh, And so they, whoever did it, you know, added the two numbers together, and -and so-and-so lives, you know, this many years and begat other sons and daughters, right? Um, And so what this is, is he's basically copying the format of Genesis chapter 5. Yeah. And Mm. so we can we can clearly see, okay, he just, he just went back and trying again, this consistent thing, trying to make it consistent and it's readable. You know, it's not, you're not getting all these random numbers. Uh, you're not getting Genesis 11, like having to add it all up in your head. No, no, he does the work for you. Like a good writer. Unfortunately, he's messing with the biblical text. So maybe not so good writer, but, um, <laughs> but, but, but he is putting that, that, uh, information out there for you. So, um, he does add those numbers up. Um, now, as far as, so that's just a textual criticism thing that indicates that, you know, maybe it's, uh, maybe he felt a little bit more free with this section of scripture than he should have. Um, let's see, between the uh, Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint, uh, they both align in recording the begetting ages of individuals across the genealogies as presented in Genesis 11. Uh, however, the Samaritan Pentateuch leaves out Canaan, uh, whereas the Septuagint adds that name. Uh, I forget, it's like the second or third generation there after the flood um, is where it's added, uh, where that name Canaan is added. Um, so as far as the post-beginning lifespans, the Samaritan Pentateuch consistently record lifespans that are exactly 100 years shorter than those found in the Septuagint. With one notable exception, that's our Fapsad, uh, whose lifespan differs by 127 years uh, between the two traditions. So uh, what ends up happening is you get the same length in um, the chronology because of the beginning years, but the people didn't live as long after the flood uh, as when you compare the Samaritan Pentateuch and the Septuagint. Um So when you compare the Samaritan Pentateuch with the Masoretic text, uh, of course, um, uh, the uh, the Masoretic text shortens those those numbers, uh, with the uh, exception of uh, Eber, uh, and that number is just off by 160 years. Uh, and so, what you end up with is the Samaritan Pentateuch generally agreeing 
with the post flood chronology, it, it, it kind of switches sides. So it, it agrees more with the Masoretic text before the flood. And then after the flood, it agrees with the uh, Septuagint. So it, it, it's kind of, it's an interesting reflection back and forth. Um, and so, you know, it just, I guess, took the middle road there. And uh, again, made it readable as far as, as, far as uh, my interpretation of those differences would be. But yeah, so that's kind of the... It's very confusing. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Like I warned everyone, <laughs> this is going to add another layer of confusion. Uh, so, yeah, another. So you yeah. sort of think in a, in a in a textual analysis, you would kind of think you could use, for example, if you have three witnesses to a text, you could use the majority, right? Two out of three, if they agree, <laughs> that must be the original. But I don't think we can do that here. I don't think. First of all, they rarely agree with each with anyone else, and there seems to be these really interesting, like the the systematic difference between the Septuagint and the and the Samaritan makes me think those two texts must be related somehow, and yet it doesn't do that in yeah. Genesis eleven. It only does that in Genesis five. Well, it does it post post. Uh, yeah, it. it, it... Yeah, it's, it's weird. Just weird. Uh, <laughs> and again, kind of getting back to the evaluation of what we see in the text overall, it's like, okay, we see these signs of somebody going through and editing it. So it's like, okay, we can we can put that one on a, a, a you know, it doesn't take as much value. It's it's not as uh, valuable for us as, as far as these numbers go. There's other places where the Pen Samaritan Pentateuch is valuable. It's just yeah, these instances, not so much. Right, right. Yeah. 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 Wow. That well, so there there we go. So we've got this extra layer of complexity. We've got these three textual traditions and that they all have their own sort of peculiarities um and and are all disagreeing with one another in in various ways. Um I I guess we should emphasize once again something that we said I think at the end of the the previous episode that um we're, we're still talking about a chronology that is only a few thousand years, you know. Mm -hmm. No, none of this is helpful, you know, if you want to insert large amounts of time into the genealogies. Um, these disagreements were, are still within fairly narrow um, limits. Um, we, we should probably just emphasize that. But uh, it does make it difficult for us to sort of assess um, then what the original chronology actually was, you know, whether any of these texts represents the original chronology, and if so, you know, which, which one. Um, so maybe that's a topic, Todd, for for another episode. Um, yeah, yeah, the, this um, gets complex really quickly. <laughs> yeah, it does. And there's actually, I'm yeah. I want to throw in a bit more complexity here. I think there's uh, there's two more ancient witnesses to this chronology, at least two more. <laughs> uh, okay, <laughs> and I think we ought to have time to look at those. And one of them is Josephus. We've mentioned Josephus before. The other one is the Book of Jubilees. Um, the Book of Jubilees is one of these extra biblical books, uh, and it's a really interesting one. It's kind of like the Book of Enoch. So if you remember Giant Cannibal Babies, uh, that came from the Book of Enoch. Uh, this is um, this is another book that has a chronology that is very specific and very well developed. The chronology is really kind of the motivation for writing the entire thing. So. Um, yeah. before we go, uh, Nate, you got anything else you want to add on Genesis 11 yeah. before we wrap it up here? Anything, any final words? <laughs> well, if anybody would, wants to go dig up the Middle East and find us some more textual witnesses, it'd be great. Uh, other than that, um, <laughs> I mean, I will too, if you guys want to fund me and train me and all that kind of stuff. Okay. Too, Sounds good. Other than that, there's not a lot. <laughs> all right. Yeah, that's great. Um, thanks ever so much, uh, Nate, for being with us today and helping us to, to navigate all of that. Um, yeah, it's, we're, we're really glad we found somebody who could talk to us about the Samaritan Pentateuch. Yes. So uh, we're, we're very appreciative. Yeah, I had to do a lot of reading. To, I, I asked him some questions about it, and he's like, why don't, why don't you come on the show and talk about it? And I was like, okay, I'll go out there and do some reading and actually get the answer. <laughs> yes. so, yeah, it was very fun. Good. I really, really enjoyed uh, looking at it. Kind of stuff, and, so. and let that be a lesson to all the listeners. If you are very well qualified and you ask me really interesting questions, you too may end up on an episode of Let's Talk Creation. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs>
Uh, well, that's brilliant. Um, th- thanks again, Nate, for be- being with us. Yeah. Um, that's been fun. Uh, and we'll be back in a couple of weeks with a- another interesting topic, I'm sure. So we'll see you then. It's so good. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of Let's Talk Creation. For more information, visit us at letstalkcreation.org, where you'll find an archive of past episodes in all our show notes. If you'd like to leave a comment or make a suggestion, you can find us on all the major social media platforms. Let's Talk Creation is brought to you in the U.S. by Core Academy of Science and in the U.K. by Biblical Creation Trust. As a listener-supported ministry, we are grateful for all of your financial support. Find out how you can make a contribution at our website, letstalkcreation.org. Also remember to like, subscribe, and share this episode with your friends. Thanks, and see you next time.